In the last two sections, we've looked at maxima and minima, max-min problems, optimization problems. Uh, two sections ago, we looked at local uh, maxima and minima and where they occur at critical points of the function. And in the last section, we looked, uh, we, can, we were more interested in global maxima and minima of functions. In two of the problems in the, that we went over in the last section, we had a function of three variables. Um, in one it was x, y, and z, and in the other one w, l, and h. We had functions of three variables where it looked like the variables could change independently in the function, but we were only looking at values of the variables that satisfied a constraint. So, for instance, we looked at, we wanted to minimize the distance from a point. Um, we wanted to find the closest point on a plane to a given point in space, which meant minimizing the distance squared function, but subject to the constraint that we only were interested in points that occurred on the plane. And then we looked at the problem where we wanted, we had a box of a certain shape with no top, and we had a, we had a specified volume, and we wanted to minimize the surface area that was used. And the surface area involved the length, the width, and the height, but those variables couldn't change independently because the length times the width times the height was a required to be a fixed volume. Those kinds of problems where you want to maximize or minimize a function subject to a constraint um, can be attacked in two different, or at least two different ways. One way is the way we looked at in the last section where what we did in both of those problems was we looked at the constraint equation, solved for one of the variables, substituted that into the function we were trying to maximize or minimize, and then we had a function of just two variables that really were allowed to vary independently. Great. You can do that, but there's another technique which is sometimes simpler, a more elegant, and just works well sometimes. And that's what this section is about. This section is on Lagrange multipliers, and it tells you, it gives you a different technique for maximizing and minimizing functions subject to a constraint. In fact, you can deal with more than one constraint and I will in the more depth part of the section, but in this part I'm just going to look at one constraint. So uh, understand the problem. We, we've got a function of, well, we typically look at functions of two variables or three variables, but it could be any number of variables, but let me just write three, and we want, our problem is we've got a function, and we want to find, well, possibly global maxima and minima, but as we saw in the last section, finding global maxima and minima boils down to finding local maxima and minima and then deciding whether they give you global ones or not. We want to find say, local, at least, extrema. Of f but where x, y, and z or x and y or x, y, and z are constrained so um, this means and for us this means i.e. required To satisfy well to satisfy some other equation at all times so to satisfy g of x y equals some constant or in the three variable case g of x y z equals a constant so technically what's happening here is we have a function that looks that is defined on, on all of the xy plane or all of xyz space, but you restrict the domain. That's what this means. You restrict the domain of these functions and only consider points that also satisfy the constraint equation. So technically, technically what we're looking about, what we're looking at are local extrema of a function that's restricted to one of these level sets, right? These, these are what we call level sets where one function equals a constant, but not a level set of this function, a level set of some other function, 
And we'd like to know, okay, so how do you tell where you have local extrema of f? Um, there is, of course, a, a, a very serious proof of what I'm about to say, but the pictures tend to be convincing. And let me just kind of draw a picture. So suppose, suppose g of x, y, z equals a constant defines some level set. So I'm going to draw an ellipsoid, but it could be most anything. Well, we, we do want g to be differentiable. And, well, I'll, I'll say more in a minute. Suppose, so this is, these are the points that we're interested in. Only these, x, y, and z, that satisfy this equation. And I'm assuming that this is that set of points. And maybe our function, like f of x, y, z, maybe it's distance squared from the origin. So that would be x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So the level sets of this are spheres, um, at least for positive, at least for positive constants. Um, and I'll assume the origin is here. So what we want to do, for instance, is minimize, find the closest point on this ellipsoid, although that's a really bad ellipsoid. Anyway, find the closest point on this ellipsoid to the origin. Well, that means minimize this function on this level set. So on this restricted domain, well, how do you do it? If you think about the, the level sets of this function, well, actually, let me move the origin a little closer. If you think about the level sets of this, they're spheres. And I'm just going to draw spheres. And OK, if we're trying to minimize the distance function at points on this set, well, or the distance squared function, well, you, know, you can see where this level set hits this ellipsoid, but then you keep changing the levels. And what we want to know is the smallest level, or the level set with the smallest value that hits. <laughs> that hits. Maybe I'll just stop with that one. That hits the ellipsoid. Well, you don't have to picture too many examples to see that at the last moment, before these level sets would miss this entirely, so I'm letting the, the value of the function get smaller. Um, at the last moment, before it would separate from here entirely, these two sets look like they should be tangent. This, one, this level set should just glance off of that level set. So they should have the same tangent plane there. But if they have the same tangent plane, you should remember that the tangent plane is perpendicular to the gradient vector which means that the gradient vector of f and the gradient vector of g should both be perpendicular to this plane. But that means they're parallel to each other. So at this point, this closest point, call it p, at p, what we ought to have at p, we would need the gradient vector of f at p is parallel to the gradient vector of g at p. But two vectors being parallel, they're parallel um, if and only if they're scalar multiples, if one's a scalar multiple of the other. Um, so one way to say that, and this is the, night, the way we'll want to look at it, i.e. either, so the zero vector has every direction, so I'm going to say either, the gradient of g of p is the zero vector, or, or this vector is a scalar multiple of that one because the vectors are parallel. Um, so, or, or there exists a scalar, which I'll call lambda, the L. Lambda, because it's a Greek version of L for Lagrange, or there exists lambda such that the gradient of F, well, let me, yes, I have run out of room, or there exists lambda 
such that the gradient vector of f at p equals lambda times the gradient vector of g at p. So, right, at that point, we should either have, and we should either have the gradient vector of g at p is a zero vector, or there exists a lambda, a sum scalar. You don't have to call it lambda, that's just standard. So the, the gradient vector of f is lambda times the gradient vector of g, which just says they're parallel. So those are the points that you look for. It's also true this is a compact set if it's really an ellipsoid. Um, it's closed and bounded. And this is a continuous function and restricted to this compact set. The extreme value theorem still applies. So this function attains a global maximum and a global minimum restricted to this set. Um, Where's the global maximum? Well, in my picture, you would keep letting the level sets, the spheres, get bigger and bigger until they just glance off of, until they just glance off of the ellipsoid again. And at this point, you should have the same thing, that either the gradient vector of g at p is zero or the gradient vector of f at p is some scalar multiple of g of p. All right. This... This is an intuitive argument in terms of level sets. Um, there's a very rigorous argument, but this is the method of Lagrange multipliers that um, local maxima and minima of a function restricted to, restricted to a level set can only occur at, well, critical points, and critical points by definition are places where either the gradient vector of g at p is zero, or the gradient of f is vector is a scalar multiple of the gradient of g. So um, this is the method of Lagrange multipliers. This, uh, this lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier. Um, we, of course, are assuming f and g are are differentiable. We, in, in general, we typically will not have this condition. Typically, we'll assume that the gradient of g is never zero on our actual level set, so that the case that we'll care about will be this one. This one typically um, won't occur for us. So let's look at some problems. This is the method. Um, ah, well, uh, it'll come up in the examples. So. Let's do a, uh, let's start with a two variable example. <coughs> so, let's look at, I want to find the, so, example. Find the global extreme values of f of x, y, equals 4x squared plus y squared, subject to the constraint that uh, x and y are on the unit circle centered at the origin. So x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay. <clears throat> so in the last section, what we would have done is solved. So you want to maximize or minimize this function, but x and y are not allowed to vary independently. This function is restricted to the set of points where this is true, or we say subject to the constraint. Um, uh, in the last section, what we would have done is solve for one of these variables in terms of the other, we'd have a plus or minus sign, and then plug it into there. We could do that here, but we want 
an easy example of Lagrange multiplier, so we're going to do it that way. Um, understand the problem. You can't, X and Y are not allowed to vary independently here. They have to satisfy this. This, a, a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin, is a compact set. So the extreme value theorem does guarantee that this has a global maximum and a global minimum. We're going to produce all the places where you could have a global maximum minimum. So find all the, the critical points. So all the places where the gradient vectors are parallel that satisfy this. And then we'll just plug them into this function and see where we get the biggest and the smallest value. So, um, all right. So this is, in my discussion a minute ago, this would be the g of xy. g of xy is x squared plus y squared, and we're looking at the level set where that equals 1. So the, the critical points of f restricted to this set, so the critical points. Well, there are places where the gradient vector of g is 0 and this constraint is satisfied. That, as I said, typically we're not going to have any of those points. So the gradient vector of g, the partial with respect to x is 2x, partial with respect to y is 2y. When does this equal the 0 vector? Well, when x is 0 and y is 0, but that's not that doesn't satisfy the constraint equation, so this doesn't happen for x and y, subject to the constraint. So the critical points are points, the critical points of that f restricted by the constraint, restricted to the constraint set, the critical points of the restricted function, it's important that it's the restriction, it, the points where, well, we need the constraint to be satisfied. So it's the points where the constraint is satisfied and the gradient vectors are parallel. So the gradient vector of f equals some scalar multiple of the gradient vector of g. But the gradient vector of f is easy. It's 8x. Oh, let me write f and g. Let me write f and g back here where they're easier to see. f was 4x squared plus y squared. g is, we're looking at g of xy is x squared plus y squared. And we're looking at where that equals 1. All right. So the gradient vector f is 8x 2y. We want that to be lambda times the gradient vector of g, which is 2x 2y. All right. How many equations does this give you? Well, this gives you two equations because the, the first and second components have to be equal, and lambda is multiplied times each component. So we'd have to have 8x equals lambda times 2x. And we need 2y equals lambda times 2y. So 2y equals lambda times 2y. So you get these two equations, but you have three unknowns. And typically, you expect, oh, I need three equations if I have three unknowns to solve. Where do we get a third equation? Don't forget, we're only we're looking for points only that we're only looking at those points that satisfy the constraint. So here's our third equation. This has to be true for the x's and y's that we care about. So now you have three equations and three unknowns, and so you try to solve for all the x's and y's. You find the x's and y's that satisfy these three equations, and we'll plug them back into the original function f and see where f is the biggest and where f is the smallest. How do you solve three equations and three unknowns that look like this? It depends. Uh, there are a lot of choices sometimes. Uh, we're going to look at two more problems after this. It just, you know, there are different people would do different algebra, but you have to be careful along the way. But um, So I'm just certainly you can go ahead and divide both equations by 2. That's easy. Um, okay, so, wow, that was a big step. I divided both equations by 2. It is tempting to divide 
both sides of this equation by x and get that, ah, lambda has to be 4, and divide both, of this, divide both sides of this by y, get lambda is 1, lambda is 4, and lambda is 1, there are no solutions. You have to be more careful than that. You can't divide by x if x is 0, and if x is 0, this equation is satisfied. So this first equation says x is 0 or lambda equals 4. One of those is true. Um, and so we'll have two cases. If x is 0, then um, if x is 0, then y squared has to be 1, so y has to be plus or minus 1. Um, it's true then that um, uh, it's true then that you could put in that y is plus or minus 1 right here. And so if y is 1, you get lambda is 1. If y is minus 1, you'd get, once again, lambda is 1. So you'd get lambda is 1. But we don't really care about the value of lambda. It's an intermediate thing. So yeah, you could write down in this case, ah, and, and lambda is 1. But we don't really care about that. We care that we got two points where it happens. Over here, yeah, I said we don't care about the value of lambda, but sometimes it comes up as an intermediate thing. So we get lambda is 4, but that means, I mean, that's another case that would make this true. If lambda is 4, we get y equals 4y. That means 3y is 0. That means y is 0. So y is 0, and if y is 0, then x squared is 1, so x is plus or minus 1. So what we quickly get are four critical points x is 0, y is plus or minus 1, and y is 0, x is plus or minus 1. And now we're just going to take those four points, plug them into the function f, and see where it's the biggest and where it's the smallest. So you just, you just do it. Here's your xy pair, and here's 4x squared plus y squared. Um, we get x is 0, and y is minus 1, x is 0, y is 1, um, x is one, uh, minus 1, and y is 0, and x is 1, and y is 0. And then you plug them into this function. So if x is 0 and y is minus 1, you get 1. If x is 0 and y is 1, you get 1. If x is minus 1 and y is 0, um, you get 4. Uh, if x is minus 1. If x is 1 and y is 0, you again get 4. All right. Well, that's, that's it. The, 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 the minimum value, so the minimum value of the function is 1. So this is the global minimum value. It occurs at two different points. Um, and the global maximum value is 4, and it occurs at two different points. All right, so that was a quick example of how you use Lagrange multipliers. Um, it's, uh, you know, we could have done it without it, but let's look at, I want to go back now and look at the two problems we did in the last section um, that had constraints and see how they look, see how it looks when we do those problems using Lagrange multipliers and you can decide whether it looks easier or harder. So um, one of our examples was um, one of our examples was find the point on the plane given by 2x plus y minus z equals 1 that's closest to 0, 1, 3. All right. And as we did before, this means we, we're going to minimize the distance function 
but that occurs at the same point where the distance squared function is minimized. So that's the little tricky thing we did to make things easier. d squared, distance squared to 0, 1, 3 is x minus 0 squared, so x squared, plus y minus 1 squared, plus z minus 3 squared. So we want to minimize this, but subject to the constraint that we only care about points on the plane. So if we call these things f and g, like I did in the general discussion, this is the constraint function, g of x, y, z. This distance squared function, you can call it f of x, y, z, or you don't have to call it this, but if you want it to match what we wrote before. Um, notice that the gradient vector of g, this time it's never zero at all. I mean, all we care about is that it's not zero at points that satisfy the constraint, but the gradient vector of g here is the partial with respect to x, so that's 2, the partial with respect to y, that's 1, and the partial with respect to z, that's minus 1. So that's the gradient vector of g, it's never 0. So um, once again, appealing to intuition that there is a global minimum, we're going to find one critical point, and that will have to be where the minimum occurs. What how do we find critical points using Lagrange multipliers? We will just require the constraint to be true and then the constraint equation, and then we'll look for places where the gradient of f is some scalar, lambda, times the gradient vector of g. So that's what you do. Okay, so we look for, we want the constraint to be true. We need to solve. We have the constraint being true. And then we need the gradient vector of f to equal some scalar multiple of the gradient vector of g. All right, the gradient vector of f is 2x, 2 times y minus 1, 2 times z minus 3, and we want that to be lambda times the gradient vector of g, which is just 2, 1, minus 1. Well, this quickly enables you to solve for x, y, and z in terms of lambda, because the first components, right, this lambda gets multiplied times each one of those, and then you match the components. We get 2x needs to be 2 lambda, 2 times y minus 1, needs to be lambda times 1, and 2 times z minus 3 needs to be lambda times minus 1, so minus lambda. All right, so this means x equals lambda, y equals 1 plus lambda over 2, and z equals 3 minus lambda over 2. All right, so we get this. Well, I've already said we don't really care about the value of lambda. Why am I writing everything in terms of lambda? Well, lambda is nice sometimes as an intermediate thing because we write x, y, and z in terms of lambda. We still have the constraint equation. And you can plug all of those into here. Then you just get one equation in terms of lambda. You solve for it. And after you do that, you plug the lambda back in here and you get x, y, and z. So that's nice. So you plug those in, you get 2 lambda plus 1 plus lambda over 2 minus, um, minus z, so minus 3 minus lambda over 2, minus lambda over 2 equals 1. Um, <coughs> simplify this, this is 2 lambda plus 1 plus lambda over 2 minus 3 plus lambda over 2 equals 1. Uh, you can cancel the 1s, 
you want. Then there's a lambda over 2 plus a lambda over 2. That's lambda plus 2 more lambda. So you get 3 lambda minus 3 equals 0, or 3 lambda equals 3. Lambda is 1. Now, as I said, we don't really care about the value of lambda, but lambda is 1 immediately gives us our single critical point, and that's where the global minimum has to occur, since we believe there is one. So we get x, y, z has to be lambda is 1. We get 1, uh, then 1 and a half, so 3 halves, and then 6 halves minus 1 half, 5 halves which of course is what we got by doing this the other way. The other way being you, we solve for z in terms of x and y and plug that back into the function f and did the max min problem with x and y. But This is how it goes with Lagrange multipliers. Um, I still want to look at the problem we did in the last section on maximizing or minimizing the area of a box with a fixed volume. The algebra looks, well, initially looks a lot worse. It actually gets pretty easy pretty quickly, but it's a little uh, scary when you look at it. So I just want to do one more example. So recall the problem that we had. We had a box, so a rectangular box. Car I don't think of it as made of cardboard. Um, so we, we've got this rectangular solid of a box. Um, it won't turn out to have the dimensions that it looks like I'm drawing, but it's got some <laughs> it's got some width, some length, and some height. It had no top, um, so that the problem is not completely symmetric in L, W, and H. Otherwise, things would be too easy. We had a fixed volume. The volume was required to be. So the volume, of course, is the length times uh, the width times the length times the height, and we wanted that to be 4,000 cubic inches. Now, so there's no top. I should have said no top. So what we want to do is minimize the area. We want to make. I mean, this this could really come up in industry. You want to make boxes that hold a certain amount of material, but you want to use as little cardboard as possible. So quick, what shape should your box be? Um, you want to minimize the area function. So A, which is you've got um, two, two sides like this, so W times H. So you've got two of those in the front and the back. And then you've got two sides like this, L times H, but you've only got one that's like the bottom, L times W, because there's no top, so plus WL. So this was our problem. We wanted to minimize this function, the area function, subject to the constraint that the volume is 4,000 square, inch, uh, square cubic inches. Cubic inches. So all the lengths are going to be in inches, all the, air, the area will be in square inches, the volume, cubic inches. All right. So um, let me, because I'm going to write gradient vectors, and I, you need to know, keep your partial derivatives in the same order, I'm going to take things in this order. You could pick any order, you just have to be consistent. I'm going to assume my gradient vectors contain first the partial derivative with respect to W, then the partial derivative with respect to L, and then the partial derivative with respect to H. All right, how do you do this problem with Lagrange multipliers? Okay, well, you do what we were doing before. We need to solve where the constraint is satisfied. And then, well, there won't be any, as, as usual, there won't be any critical, there won't be any places where the constraint function has gradient zero. But we need to solve L times, uh, W times L times H equals 4,000. And then we need that the gradient vector of A is some scalar multiple of the gradient vector of, I'll just write, 
LWH. <coughs> okay, and I will point out why this gradient vector can't be zero, but if it could, we'd check at least if places where the constraints satisfy. But if it could, we'd just check those. Um, so what do we do? Well, the gradient vector of our function A is not hard to calculate. I remind you, we are going in the order of W, L, H. So the gradient vector of A, the partial derivative with respect to W is 2H plus L. The partial derivative with respect to L is 2H plus W. And the partial derivative with respect to H is 2W plus 2L. So that's the gradient vector of A. And we want to know where this equals lambda times the gradient vector of this. All right, the partial with respect to W, L times H. Partial derivative with respect to L, W times H. And the partial derivative with respect to H, W times L. Um, if this gradient vector is zero, well, then, you know, for instance, even if the first component is zero, L or H would have to be zero. That would immediately make L W times L times H zero, not 4,000. So you know, the gradient vector of this function, of the constraint function, is never zero. That's our usual case. And now we, but now we have to satisfy four fairly nasty looking equations. You get, all right, so matching components, you get 2H plus L has to equal lambda times LH, 2H plus W has to equal lambda times WH, 2W plus 2L has to equal lambda times WL. And don't forget the constraint. We need, I'll write it again, W times L times H equals 4,000. Now, in general, there's no specific way that you start with four equations in that aren't linear, because um, you've got L times H's and W times H. There's no general technique, ah, here's what you do and it always works. You just do different things in different situations. There are a lot of things you could do here. I'm going to do something that looks fairly easy and comes up is a good thing to try fairly often. I'm going to take this line and just divide it by this line. Now, to do that, you have to know that things aren't zero. Well, HL and W are all positive. They're length, widths, and heights of a box. So these sides aren't zero. Well, then these sides also aren't zero unless lambda is zero. But if lambda is zero, 2H plus L and 2H, or 2H plus W would be, or and 2H plus W be zero, but that can't happen because H and W are positive. So <laughs> I'm just verifying that we're not dividing by zero. You, you need to check that. You need to be careful. But nothing that we're dividing by could be zero. So we're going to divide this line by this line and get 2H plus L over 2h plus w equals, and why do this? Because if you divide this side, the lambdas cancel and the h's cancel, and you're just left with l over w. Now, I'll say it again. You could do different algebra. This is just a thing you can do, and frequently this dividing one line by the next to cancel out the lambdas is a good technique, but frequently it's not. Now you can cross multiply, or what's the same thing, get a common denominator and match the numerators, but most people call it cross multiplying. If you multiply W times that, you would need 2WH plus WL equals L times this, which is 2LH plus WL. You need for that to be true. The WLs are the same, so we can cancel those. Um, we can cancel the twos. H is not zero. We can divide by H. And you immediately conclude W has to be L. Well, you know, you could have, this is how you can get that mathematically, but just intuitively, the whole problem is symmetric in terms of W and L, the length and the width. So if there's only one critical point, it better have W equals L. And we found that in the last section, but it's nice to see it again. All right, so that's what we conclude from dividing one of these lines by the other one that W has to be the same as L. Well, now if we just plug that into here and like get rid of all the W's, 
we'll just have L and H. Um, uh, I shouldn't say that. Let, let's reduce. I was going to say we'd just have L and H, but hey, we'd still have that lambda in there. So let's, let's now plug in our information at W equals L and see how it simplifies the rest of the problem for us. I'll try to fit it in right here. So W equals L. So if I put that in, well, I can put that in the constraint if I want. So I'm going to, I don't know, keep the L's and get rid of the W's. So if I put it in the constraint, I get L squared H equals 4,000. If I put in the W equals L right here, so write everything in terms of L instead, I get 2L plus 2L, so I get 4L equals, I'm replacing W with L, equals lambda times L squared. All right, I just replaced the W's with L's. So either L is zero, but L is the length, it's not zero. So we can divide by L. So you get four equals lambda times L. Or what's the same thing? Lambda equals four over L. Okay, so that's what happened when I plugged in L equals W here, and we can, uh, yeah, we can, if we now, now we'll just use that lambda is 4 over L. If, if lambda is 4 over L, then, um, well, we can put that in everywhere. Uh, let me put that in here. So I'm going to put that in right here. That lambda is 4 over L. You get 2H plus L equals lambda, which is 4 over L, times, la times LH. All right. Uh, I swear we're getting somewhere. So this tells you the L's cancel. And so this is just 4H. You can subtract 2H from both sides and get that L is 2H. Now, hopefully you, you haven't gotten lost. Is this the best algebra to do? We first found W is L. Then I put that in here and found lambda is 4 over L. And I put it in, a, well, in the constraint and wrote the constraint in terms of that. And now we found that Plugging that into here, we found that L is 2H. Are we getting anywhere, and is this the easiest? Well, you can try other ways. Um, none of them are going to be trivial, but uh, some way, other ways might look easier to you. Are we finished? Well, essentially, because this says H is L over 2. And now you can put that in this simplified constraint. So we get L squared times H, but H is L over 2, equals 4,000. So L cubed, so we get this, that means L cubed is 8,000. So L is 20. Cube root of 8 is 2, the cube root of 1,000 is 10. So L is 20, and then we already knew that W is L, so you get W is 20. And finally, we knew that H was L over 2, so H is 10. So this is how the solution, so those are the dimensions that minimize area. This is how the solution works with Lagrange multipliers. You could do different algebra. Um, it, these look a little scary, and you, know, you might think that's way more difficult than what we did before, which was to solve the constraint for one of the variables, h in terms of w and l, plug that in the function and then just do the two variable problem. Um, if this looks more complicated to you, well, maybe it is. And it's true that Lagrange multipliers sometimes make problems look more difficult. On the other hand, sometimes you can't solve the constraint for one of the variables. It's just, you know, you, uh, you can't do the algebra. So you wouldn't be able to do this. You wouldn't have another choice. You wouldn't be able to solve. Um, but 
Also, as we saw in the distance to the plane problem, you know, minimize, find the point on the plane closest to the point. Lagrange multipliers made that problem easier. So should you use Lagrange multipliers? It's, you know, in some problems it's better, some problems it's not. If you're just given a problem, you know, opti maximize or minimize this fun function subject to this constraint, you can try the Lagrange multipliers first, see if it's easy, and if that fails, try to solve for one of the variables and plug that in, or you could try the plugging in first. It's, uh, it's just a matter of, well, <laughs> it just depends on the problem which one is easier. Um, but frequently, you're just flat out told you have to use Lagrange multipliers, and then you don't have a choice. This is the kind of thing you have to do.